Al and I were um, looking at different places of interest to go and to see, and then when I was looking through the newspaper, I came across the American Clock and Watch Museum in Bristol, Connecticut. And I said to Al, I said, I think this is a place we'd really like to go and be able to show to our community. And when we made the phone call, we were put in contact with Jennifer. Well, I welcome you both and all the viewers at home, of course. Um, if you could tell us your position here. Yes. Um, as executive director, um, we're a very small staff um, and working as a small nonprofit in the area, but my position is working on um, future planning for programs and events and uh, work with membership and development. The American Clock and Watch Museum is a, a nonprofit uh, educational and research organization, and we're dedicated to promoting the history of American made clocks and watches for the general public. Um, we have a, uh, a lot of clock enthusiasts, clock and watch enthusiasts who come to visit us, but also a large portion of our visitation is the general public. Uh, and this year, 2012, marks the 60th anniversary of the American Clock and Watch Museum uh, in Bristol. And it began in 1952. It was established by Edward Ingram, who was the president of the E. Ingram Company uh, in Bristol. And at the time, there were only two companies um, Sessions and Ingram that were producing clocks. Um, and as Edward Ingram said, it was sort of the, the end of the heyday of clock making. And he was sort of noticing that and had become a clock collector and some of his friends as well. Got this group together and they established the museum. Um, and then the next step was to find a home for it. Uh, they had debated whether or not to make it part of the Ingram company. Um, but what they ended up doing is the, the company donated funds so that they could purchase uh, the Miles Lewis House, which is where we have been located um, since 1954. So when visitors first come to the museum, the first thing they, they see is this 1801 federal style home. And, and what's important um, is that the early founders of the museum really wanted an early American setting for these early American clocks that they were donating to the collection. Um, so the Miles Lewis House, built in 1801 in the Federal Hill District of Bristol, became the home. Um, l later, as more and more donations were occurring, um, by 1956 they built um, the Barnes Wing, which is where we're standing right now, and you actually you salvage from um, one of the earliest houses in Bristol, 1728, and it was a uh, Barnes family house. So they were able to use salvage for, for a lot of what we see in this room. Um, and then later on, again, adding the Ingram wing, which is another addition. And there's also, there's always talk of how we're gonna expand into the future, so you never know how <laughs> large sure. the place is gonna get. But um, so I, I think with that, we can go and meet the curator. Tom Grimshaw is our curator, and he can give us a more in-depth look at the history of clock and watchmaking. Okay, that sounds excellent. Hi, Tom. It's nice meeting you. I'm Sue. Susan Grimaldi. Nice, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. And thank you to Al and, and Sue coming to our museum. Uh, we have a, a wonderful museum here, which we are very happy and very pleased that you came down to... Uh, showcase us. Uh, we have over 2,200 clocks in the collection and we have over 3,500 watches and uh, what we try to do is tell the story of America's contribution to not only America's watch and clock making but the world's um, uh, clock and watch making which we were very influential. The story is here and why don't we begin by examining some of the tall case clocks that we have in the Barnes Wing and the history of how the America horology developed over the period from roughly 1806, even earlier, right up on through until the, the clocks ceased being produced here in Connecticut. Lead away. Thank you very much, and let's begin. Uh, what you're going to be seeing here in the Barnes Wing are the earliest uh, clocks that we have in the museum that are American manufactured. We have a large collection of clocks, approximately 2,200 clocks. We have approximately 3,500 watches as well. And the miracle behind all of this is that all but 30 or so of, the, of these watches and clocks have been donated to the museum. Wow. So what you're going to see is a gigantic gift from America to this museum, and we're going to explore that as we go forward here. Okay, well, I'm really looking okay. forward to this. All right, where should we start in it first? 
What we want to start is with the early uh, history of the clock making in America. Uh, it was characterized by being a product that only the super wealthy could afford. It would take one man one month to make one movement and do the dial, uh, and therefore it was very, very expensive. And it was caught in this cycle of there was no demand because it was so expensive. And because it was so expensive, nobody could buy it. So production was very low. For example, we have one of the account books of Daniel Burnap, who was considered a fairly prolific maker. Mm -hmm. And in one year, his total production was six clocks. Now, they had to do other things besides, so they were repairing glasses, silver, pewter, fixed watches, whatever came in the door, they were general mechanics of the area. And as almost as a sideline, if somebody had the money, they could order a clock and they would have to then make it. Uh, you couldn't walk into a clock shop uh, at that particular time. Clocks were made to order. We were talking about uh, Harland really being a very influential Connecticut clockmaker. This is one of his tall case clocks. This is called the Norwich case with the, with the carved shell that we have here. Notice the, the beautiful scalloping work that was done here and the extra fancy work on, on the feet. This was a high piece of furniture, a very expensive silver dial, eight day. If the truth be known though, those that have, uh, of us that have repaired these clocks, because brass was so dear, these plates that he made the movement out of were extra thin the gears were extra thin. This was really a cheap deal that really looked great. But uh, these are, are very, very uh, highly sought after today and, and they are really a magnificent piece of furniture. Uh, the earliest American tall case clock uh, that we have uh, of the formal variety uh, is a clock made in uh, 1735 by Henry Harmson, who has an interesting history. Uh, he absconded from the army and, and was hunted down and uh, uh, evaded uh, the authorities and ended up uh, in Rhode Island and we think trained with Claggett. And uh, uh, then he moved in, into Massachusetts and it was during that time uh, that he, he was recorded as a watchmaker uh, and it was at that time that he actually made this formal tall case clock. Uh, formal tall case clocks uh, of this era, American, are very rare. Uh, less than 20 are, are known to exist at this point. This is one of the 20. Um, this is a, uh, a very different uh, kind of, of clock than what was produced later in Massachusetts. It's of an earlier style. The veneer on the side is, is actually almost an, uh, a total 16th or, uh, or more thick. Uh, it, it's like paneling rather than veneer. Um, this clock has undergone a major restoration. We found that the blind uh, fretwork up on the hood at the top uh, was 1920s linoleum and uh, as for a repair and so we've had this clock completely disassembled of the case with all the veneer off everything taken off re-put down the parts that were missing uh, were generated and copied off of a claggett clock that was of of the similar era and and fit the design almost perfectly to what we had uh, remaining with the case and it's, it's now restored to its, uh, its full glory. And uh, this, it was a, another recent donation and uh, a, another uh, very generous person paid uh, the entire amount to have this clock restored, which was substantial. But it is a great uh, piece of history uh, for this museum to have. Now, as we go forward uh, with this, uh, this example is uh, by Simon Willard, who was a very famous maker. Uh, started out in Grafton and then moved into the Boston area, actually Roxbury. And they started to manufacture clocks 
uh, on, a, on a larger basis rather than just, uh, as they were all made singly, but they actually brought in uh, extra workers and they started to make these clocks in larger volumes. They still had a problem that it was only for the wealthy and they immediately turned around and, and tried to start shrinking the clock, and making it less expensive. And we have some examples that were done by Simon Willard. He was most famous for what is called the banjo clock. And that was less expensive than the tall case clock. They also made what was called the Massachusetts shelf clock, which was about a third the size of a tall case clock, less expensive. So they knew the market was there, but the, the uh, ability to manufacture the movements was, uh, was really hard to do. Brass was scarce, very scarce in America. So it was expensive material-wise, it was expensive labor-wise, and uh, they were sort of stuck in, in this particular mode. And it went on from essentially uh, from the first clock makers all the way up until about 1805. So a period of well over 100 years, production exceedingly small. The other source of clocks was the imports from Europe. Now if you'd like to see one of the banjo clocks, we could come in and take a, a picture of that to see what was being done to try to, to decrease the cost of a clock and uh, the beauty that uh, Simon Willard created during this period of time. What you're seeing here is the, uh, one of the first examples of Simon Willard's uh, banjo clock. Uh, the first ones were characterized uh, by these beautiful tablets uh, that were painted. Uh, this is the earliest of the, th of the uh, models with the, the throat, which is between the head and the base, being held on only by two screws. So it was a very fragile design, uh, and this particular example was a gift from a, uh, a, a woman that uh, was offered such a low amount of money when she went to sell it. She said, if it's only worth that, then we're going to give it to the American Clock and Watch Museum. And All we right. went, okay, that's, that, right. that's what we like to hear. This example is as good as any example that exists in the country. That's one of the reasons it's behind glass. We don't want to get anywhere near it. We don't want the weight in it. This is for preservation. This is absolutely one of the, the most pristine examples. It even it contains the original gilt, never cleaned off of the brass bezel. It's just remarkable, and we are so fortunate to have this example. Okay, what are we looking at here? Well, in Connecticut, uh, we were making the same kind of a clock as was made in other parts of the country, uh, in like Boston. Mm -hmm. And here we have a tall case clock um, made by Nathan Howell out of New Haven. He was born in 1741. And uh, so he's probably, this clock was probably made when he was 30 or so. So we're talking about 1775. And this particular clock, if you took it and compared it to an English clock, you would not know that there's any difference. And we probably think because of these grooved barrels that are on the side, that these were probably imported from England. And he, what part of this clock he actually made, or whether he bought a, what, an e-bosch, which is just the crude parts that need to be finished or not, and he finished it off, or if he made major parts of this, we really don't know but it's strictly English design. It has a rack and snail strike control, which you see this snail here right in the middle. And this was done so that no matter what time was showing on the clock, it would always strike the right number of hours. So if you let the clock run down and the time kept on going for a while, and so it would be out of sequence, this never goes out of sequence, it always knows what time the clock should strike and match the hand position at the hour. That's better than some of the clocks we have now well, when the power goes well, out. There you go. So this was quite an invention, but strictly English. Now, another early maker in Connecticut, Thomas Harland, was making clocks. He trained another clock maker, uh, Daniel Burnap, and who I mentioned before that made the six clocks. And the, both of these guys were great engravers. If you take a look at the dials, 
They're wonderfully engraved. This one that we have here for the Nathan Howell clock is a typical, very crude composite dial. Uh, Jennifer's uh, holding this, and you'll see how absolutely thin it is. We can actually bend it. It's just flimsy as can be, and uh, which was typical of the of the American manufacturing at at that particular time. Was that because of the expense of the material? Brass was very dear. Uh, one of the reasons that we really couldn't uh, do anything uh, and and get the cost down was was the expense of getting the brass. A lot of the brass was uh, imported. It was all cast. So that, uh, for example, to make the plate, just the plate on this thing, what they had to do is they would cast as, as well as they could the square. Mm -hmm. The brass was soft, so they would take a hammer and hammer it to harden it. Then they would file it. Then they would hammer it again to make it harder. Mm -hmm. And when they had the hardness right, they would try to file this down and finish this off. All hand done. So you can start to see the labor that went into every part of this particular clock and why it took so long to make just one movement. Now Burnap trained a young man uh, who became very famous, uh, Eli Terry. He was trained in brass, how to make a brass clock. And uh, he, we believe that, that his, what is called his apprentice clock still survives. And it was the clock that he made that showed that uh, I am now a bona fide clockmaker. And um, Eli Terry, though, was a, an inventive genius. He wasn't just learning and not thinking about the future or how to make improvements. He went up to uh, the Hartford area and also got trained in making wooden gear uh, clocks uh, by the Cheneys. And an example of what was going on in Connecticut and the surrounding area is this, this clock, which you can see, is very crudely made. Some of it looks like it was just hacked out of wood. And in fact, if we turn this around, uh, you will see that some of this was carved with a knife. This part right yep. here, it's, it's, it's so crude. A giant escape wheel, which is between the plates, everything bulky, look at the size of the main wheel here, how large it is. It's, it is very crude. Labor-wise, this took as much time to make as the brass clock. It was just made out of a cheaper material. So this could undersell the brass clock. However, this would run only 30 hours on a winding, so you had to wind it every day. This would run for eight days. Now this is out of wood, you said. Right. Now wouldn't there um, be over a period of time of it like warping or, you know, with the moisture getting in where it could split or anything? Well, there, we'll we're going to be talking a lot about the wood and the problems with wooden gear clocks. And you've hit the nail on the head that right. the wood moves and uh, they did everything they could to prevent that. Uh, but. Uh, will pre-answer one of the questions. One of the reasons that, that these clocks were difficult to sell and one of the major problems was that they couldn't transport it over water because it would start to absorb moisture mm -hmm. and uh, they would, would not w work well. Even, even uh, selling them in different parts of the country, we have records where, the, where they sold the wooden gear clock and then they would report back the darn things don't work. And a lot of it was due to this, you know, to the movement and humidity and so forth. Now, Eli Terry, after uh, being fully trained in, in this, some training in wood, by 1795 to 1800, and even possibly a little later, he was making both wooden gear clocks and brass clocks. Very few brass clocks, but the, the volume that, that he started to produce started to go up fairly substantially. The problem Terry had was that he could make the clock, but how do you sell it? And there were reports of him that he would take four clocks that he completed, go on horseback, and knock on doors and try to sell it. That's not how you do a volume business. That's for sure. <laughs> and uh, so it, it was, it was a, a very a tough business uh, to be in. 
Uh, Terry also, as we started to, to look at his movements before 1806, we started to see that the gearing started to look similar. And uh, Ward Francelon, who was one of the first researchers into wooden gear clocks in the United States, actually got a number of, of these early clocks and found they were totally interchangeable gears. So prior to uh, mass production, Eli Terry was already thinking about, why don't I standardize this thing? And he eventually was making clocks in batches, we believe, of 25. So the production was going up, the price was starting to drop, but it still wasn't there yet. And then there was the big change. It was a tsunami for not only the clock making industry, but it was a, a sea change of ideas and how you build a, a product in the United States. And that was, if you could take the interchangeable parts and if you, could, if you could get machinery to make these parts in bulk, and you could do it with power, and you could hire unskilled labor to actually build it, you could start to drop the price drastically. Mm -hmm. And in 1806, the miracle happened. Two gentlemen, one a minister uh, named Porter and another businessman named Porter, they were not brothers, uh, from Waterbury came to Terry and basically said, we see that you're producing these in fairly large quantity. Could you really up the stroke? And Terry said, I believe I can. And in fact, I can make, I believe, 4,000 movements inside of three years. Wow. Now, here was the genius behind it. The porters would sell the clocks. Terry didn't have to worry about the marketing of the clocks. So he could sell the clocks. He'd get the dial painters. He had, had all of the bell makers. He had the, the, the people that would make the weights. All of that was in place. Terry would make the clock. And Terry came out. And he took one year in 1806, bought a piece of property in Plymouth, uh, Connecticut. He hired uh, two carpenters, joiners, they were called then. One was Silas Hoadley. And uh, in the second year, he hired the one that most people uh, name is familiar, and that's Seth Thomas. So between Terry, Thomas, and Hoadley, they built the factory. They built the jigs and the fixtures. They got the water power, they designed the, the machinery to make interchangeable parts, and even though people were derisive of him and made jokes about, I'll buy the 300th one, not a, let alone the, the, the ones in the thousands. Well, Terry confo confounded everybody, and they made the 4,000 movements. Dropped wow. the price, he was selling them wholesale at $4 a piece, when you were talking about an English type tall case clock probably bringing anywhere from 75 to 125 dollars. Vast, vast difference. We, this is an exact, ex, this is one of what we call the Porter contract movements. Now when you contrast that and place it up against this earlier Connecticut made movement, you see how much slimmer it is, mm -hmm. how much more finished it looks, how much more compact it is. Even the size of the gears that they the use. The size of the gears drop down. The teeth are perfectly uniform. Mm -hmm. So this now is the product that Terry produced. This was the first mass-produced product in the United States. This is what changed the world. For the first time, not only could you build an item, but say a gear broke in, a, in, a, in the clock. All you had to do was call back and say, I need number three gear on the strike side. They were already made. All you did was interchange it. It was, it was brilliant. Now, there was still a problem, however, and that was you bought the movement, the dial, the pendulum, and uh, no case. So you had to go to your local case maker and have them make 
the case for the clock. So that was an extra expense. Now, they weren't warranted unless they were cased. But a lot of people anyways just took them and put them up on the wall and they were called wag on the walls because the pendulum would wag back and forth and it was all exposed. So the, if they were near the kitchen, they were by the fire and the soot and you know, all of this, this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That's why they, they weren't warranted. But from that time forward, if you were going to produce and compete with Terry, you had to have these mass production techniques or you, you virtually could not produce in bulk volume. Wasn't true for brass at this time, but it was certainly true for the wooden gear clocks. Between the farmers and the clock makers and the furniture makers, they literally virtually took down every tree in Connecticut by 1840 or 50 or so, and all the original growth was gone. And that didn't start to recover uh, until uh, well after the 1900s. So wood was cheap. These are made out of oak plates, laurel or ivy for the arbors, and cherry gears. And that, that was pretty standard. And this was the clock that, that changed uh, how production was done in, in the United States. I think if Eli Terry came back today and went into any factory, uh, he would be shocked at the computers. He'd be shocked at the robots. He would not be shocked at the way things are put together. They're still using his techniques that were done of the assembly, interchangeable parts. All of that was put together uh, by Eli Terry. Now, in fairness, in Europe, they had come very close and in some cases were making interchangeable parts. I don't think Terry was knowledgeable of it, and they didn't do it in the bulk and the volume to produce the entire product like Terry did. Well, that just shows you the brilliance, though, that all these years later, if he was able to come back and to see that the, the mechanisms and stuff like that still have the same base, I mean, that's inconceivable. An average person now trying to invent something and then being able to come back so many years later, the odds are it would not be the exact right. same thing. You, I mean, they changed just the computers from the time right. they first started. Well, and you know, I think it'd been interesting if he went to uh, Detroit and saw the moving line of assembly. Uh, that that was a would be a difference uh, as as well. So this then became the clock of the day for the common man, and and we we now got we broke that cycle of it being too expensive for more of the people to buy, and therefore more quantity would sell, and we got that cycle going: more volume, less mm -hmm. price, bigger business. All right, that's the American way. Yeah, there you go. All right, now the next thing that we would like to do is, uh, as I said, uh, one of the problems was is that you had to go get your own case. You could not walk again into a store and say, I want to buy a clock. Uh, be, you, could, you could potentially get this through the, for, through the Porter contract, but you couldn't go into a, a store and say, I would like, uh, uh, this clock and not that clock. There was no variety. You, you got the tall case, or you got what was made in Massachusetts, or you got what was imported. Mm -hmm. Nothing of Connecticut manufacture. From this point forward, however, Terry had the money. He'd made a lot of money by, by producing these movements, and he turned his genius next to producing a total clock, and it was in the form of a shelf clock. And we've got to move to another room to see that history. Okay, well, let's go. We just uh, exited from the, the earliest of the uh, uh, clocks uh, that were mm -hmm. made, made in America, and we go to the next step. When Edward Ingram put this uh, museum together, uh, one of the things, they started with approximately 90 clocks that were donated by he and one other person. And these guys had very great taste and eyes because they, they, they had in their collection, when there wasn't that, all that much knowledge about the history, mm -hmm. they had some very, very important clocks. And one of those clocks uh, that we have here at Bristol is this, what is called the Terry Box Clock. After Terry finished with the, with the Porter contract, he started to try to shrink that movement and put it into something that was smaller so that it would be easier to sell. You didn't have to, when you wanted to move it from room to room and set it up, far easier than a tall case clock. 
and, uh, and expand the market again. It took them two years plus to uh, take this uh, uh, effort and design a movement, that, a wooden gear movement that would fit inside of a small case. And this is really the prototype of that thought process. It's called, as I said, the box clock. It has no ornamentation on it. Uh, it is strictly plain. They didn't even make a dial for it. They just painted the numbers and the numerals on, on the, the glass. This has a, what they call a strap movement. You see it isn't solid plate like the tall case clock that we saw in there. It's mm -hmm. kind of skeletonized. It has the rack and snail uh, strike control. This was pretty elaborate uh, on this, this type of thing. Uh, this was made, we believe, uh, someplace around 1815. There's a little discrepancy between 14, 15, what month, but someplace in that, in, in that, in that area. And he started the work on the design in 1813. Actually, I think he had this probably pretty well in hand by 1814, but uh, very minor discrepancy. What this clock proved was you could mass produce again mm -hmm. a clock and now shrink its size and not only sell the movement and the dial and so forth, you could make a whole clock out of it. And the, the case almost looks like a, a shadow box. The way it is set up, it has a beautiful wooden case around it, but it just seemed like very simple you neon know, knob to be able to open up. Uh, it's it's the it's the it's the simplest of designs, and uh, they they didn't want to I I think spend a lot of time on the case design. What they were trying to show here is could they make the movement, and th this there are only eight uh, of these known at this particular uh, time, and boy we've searched uh, all over. And uh, we think eight is it. And uh, when I said that, uh, that uh, Edward Ingram had a good eye, uh, he had a good eye to, to get this clock for the Bristol Museum. But um, very shortly thereafter, after this was done, and, and even though Eli and Terry, uh, Eli Terry invented this particular movement, Seth Thomas actually made uh, the case and probably bought the movement and cased it up. Mm -hmm. And so the label inside is of Seth Thomas, not Eli Terry, even though it was Eli Terry that d designed the movement. The next event that happened is they took this box and made it pretty. And they made it pretty by putting on a top and a bottom. Oh, I'd say they made it beautiful, yes. It, here's the box. Okay, I can see that, yeah. Similar type of strap movement, and but we're going to put a scroll on the top. We'll put some feet on it and put some uh, pillars on the side. He even reeded this particular section to make it extra fancy. And this became the pillar and scroll clock. And this became what was called the common clock. Because from about 1815 through 1825, if you wanted an American cheap clock, wooden gear clock, you basically could buy a pillar and scroll clock. Even the design that's on it, it almost looks like gold if you really look at it from, from this angle right here. This is a reproduction glass, and we're gonna be, we just acquired this uh, clock. Uh, this is very rare. There are only seven of these known. But this is the first pillar and scroll we believe designed. And we, we know that from an account by Chauncey Jerome, who made the first pillar and scroll case for Eli Terry, and then said, but Seth Thomas had been making them for several years. And this is Seth Thomas's pillar and scroll. Therefore, we believe this is the first scroll. Now, if you look at it, its proportions are not good. The, the feet are squat, they're short. The scrolls are rolled over and they don't sit up uh, and, and in good proportion to, to, to the case. And when Eli Terry said, well, I'm going to build a pillar and scroll and do it right, he produces this clock, which is now called the outside escapement pillar and scroll. And you see the escapement and you see the verge 
on the front of the clock. Okay, when you say in the escapement, if you could just point that out That's to me. the wheel that's on the front of the dial. Okay. And the reason that he designed it this way is remember I said about brass wearing steel. Yes. And you had to clean it. Here you could just open the door, move a, a little arm, take the verge off, clean the verge, clean the teeth. You didn't even have to take the clock apart. And that was Terry's invention. Basically, everything else we'd looked at, the verge was between the plates. Right. Here it's on the outside, and that's why it's called the outside escapement. The, the particular uh, uh, event here then was, Terry designs a separate movement, looks different with solid plates. Thomas continues with this strap arrangement uh, with a count wheel, and uh, he was supposed to pay Terry uh, for the use of the movement, which he didn't do. It was patented, but the patent uh, legal system was so primitive that the patent really couldn't be upheld. Uh -huh. They patented every little aspect of the clock, the positions of the, of the arbors coming through the plates to the, to the minus amount. So if you change that by one eighth of an inch, they say, well, it's, it's outside the patent. All Terry had to do was patent that you move the escape wheel to the outside of the, of the movement and uh, put the verge on a pin and, and hold it on there. If he would have just said, that's my patent, he would have been even wealthier. But he got it all mixed up in all this other stuff. And there was a settlement between Terry and Thomas and uh, over time. Uh, at first we thought it was a friendly suit to keep others out, but it, it turned out to be a real, a real lawsuit. So this became uh, Terry's competition to Thomas. And the, the particular uh, clock uh, did fairly well. He changed designs of the movement. The problem with these two clocks is that there are four arbors or gears in the train. And what that means is that the clock doesn't run that long. If you had put in a fifth arbor, it will run for longer on a winding. If you put in another gear, you could turn it into a month clock. But you get so much friction and so little power delivered to the escape wheel, they didn't run right. So these are four arbor uh, movements. They probably didn't run a full 24 hours. So they weren't that practical. And in 1823, Harry again, instigator of developing a brand new type of movement. Here we see solid plates. Here we see the verge outside of the front plate. The verge here and the escape wheel outside of the front plate. A front a count wheel that we can look at and, and examine. This uh, is the five arbor train. This runs 30 hours on a winding. So you have to wind it every day, but you got six hours of grace in case you missed, which was much better than those particular clocks. This movement became absolutely copied by anybody that felt that they could get away with it, would copy this and make movements based on this particular design. And from 1823, roughly through the end of the pillar and scroll era, this was the kind of movement that you would find in there, some with brass and some with other uh, types of movements. So this became the standard clock. This is the only clock you could buy through the early 20s. Basically, there were a few exceptions, but in any volume, this was the clock that, that uh, became America's clock. The next great innovation did, really didn't involve the movement, but involved the case. Very, very different than the pillar and scroll. This uh, clock was invented and I put that in quotes, by uh, Chauncey Jerome, who was a promoter. One of, one of the most interesting stories to me about one of the clockmakers. At the age of 11, his father dies. His mother literally packs his clothes and a lunch and says, I cannot afford and can't take care of you. You have to find a way on your own. 
he left the house and knocked on doors and a farmer took him in. At 11 years At of age. At 11 years of age. He apprenticed as, uh, as a woodworker, uh, whether it was a cabinet maker or as a joiner, cabinet maker being higher. Uh, he went through the process and became, became skilled uh, as, a, as a case maker. And he went in, into a competition with, uh, with Eli Terry uh, and uh, became, and we're gonna be talking more about Chauncey Jerome because there were some major innovations that he brought forth uh, a decade later, a decade and a half later. But the reason this, this clock became so popular, the manufacturers loved it because it could be made cheaper than the pillar and scroll and it could be sold for more money than the pillar and scroll. The market was better for this design than it was for the pillar and scroll. And the thing that really set this one off was the mirror. I was just going to ask at that point, it looked like it was a mirror. It yeah. is a mirror. And he called this his invention, which was not true. Uh, Ives had invented a mirror-looking glass clock uh, in, in the early 1800s. This was 1824. Um, in, in his autobiography, he said, I invented this in 1824. And the, they never found the clock with the right label denoting that it was 24. And they said he was fuzzy, he, he missed his dates, and so forth. Then this clock pops up. This is the only one known. It's the only survivor that proves that Jerome's autobiography was correct. He did make it. It was 1824. And this is the only one known. At this at this particular time, it looks like it's in mint condition. Well, it's over. It's a little. It looks good because it's been a little over restored, but it's the only one. Yeah. So we love it. Absolutely, <laughs> so, I could see that. Now, this clock changed in design, but it's it's the tall with the half pillars, and uh, you see the next generation over there. And how they sold this clock basically is they would go uh, to communities. And the, the, they would have sellers that would literally end up loading these on buckboards and taking them to houses and trying to sell them. And of course, uh, they'd go into communities that didn't have much cash, especially in the South. And uh, the first sale was, was basically one of the tricks they would use to say, would you allow us just to leave the clock here? I'm going to see others and we'll pick it up on the way back. Now. A week later, or three days later, or whatever, they'd return. The wife and daughter had a mirror for the first time. The house had a status symbol. They knew what time it was. It was a beautiful piece of furniture. They sold like hotcakes. They sold so well that some of the southern states put an excise tax on it because the Yankees, those damn Yankees, were taking all the cash out of the south. And they prohibited, basically, the sales of, of these particular clocks. The response to that was, is they sent down the parts, put in southern labels, assembled them down there, and that was okay. Salesmanship 101. <laughs> 101. So this was the next evolution. This clock, for a, approximately um, from 1824 until the mid-30s, was produced in vast, vast quantities. The pillar and scroll was starting to, to decline, and, and, and pressures were coming in to bear, and that by more competition. George Mitchell, uh, who was a businessman here in Bristol, brought in two people uh, into Bristol that really started to ignite uh, the whole Bristol being the center of Connecticut clock making. One was Elias Ingram, who designed more clock cases, and we'll be talking about him later and uh, Ephraim Downs, who became a movement maker and was very successful, and Chauncey Jerome uh, came in. Uh, he was influenced by, uh, by George Mitchell to come to, to Bristol. And Elias Ingram was very interesting. Um, I, I, I kind of, when I reread about him, I came up with a different opinion about him. And that is, he would be, I think, considered a rock star. In, in today's, he, he goes through apprenticeship and his first job is designing a 
new case to compete with those Terry's and all these other guys, and he hires Elias Ingram. Right, <laughs> out of school. I mean, how do you get a job like that? Well, he, he, his talent was recognized. And what Elias designed were several things. This is now the mid, mid 30s. Comes to Bristol in 1834. He designs the empire case, cornices, columns, Corinthian column caps, carved feet. The middle clock up here is fully carved with feet. Some of them have pineapple finials. And he designs these cases and they become very popular. The reason we treasure this particular clock is that Elias ends up with this clock in his, in his private uh, collection. collection. It wasn't really a collection, but this is the clock he went back and bought, and we think this is the first clock he designed, and that's why he got it. And we do have a photograph here at the museum of him as an aged man standing about like this with this exact clock. This was his clock. Right and joy. So after this, there were a couple of developments. One was we got to change the case and design different things. So they, they put reeded columns on, uh, on, on, on the taller case clocks. The stencil clocks we've talked about, all this carved business went on and they, be, they went into competition. Now, I want to hold up some movements as well. The movement makers, to get around Terry's patent, designed very different movements. Let me get this one over here, sure. too. You see these look very different. Would you like me to hold one? No, that's all right. Okay. I'll have you hold the other one over there, though, if you'd like. Now the one you're holding is by Boardman, and this was his design. It, w it was really based off of a tall case design and shrunk and miniaturized and put into shelf clocks. So Boardman gets around Terry's patent by designing that movement. There, there'd be nothing that Terry could complain about. This is very different looking. Nothing that Terry would, could complain about except that this does have the verge outside. It's, it's missing on this clock, but you see the pin that holds it. Mm -hmm. So the verge and the escape wheel go on the outside. Otherwise, it's, it's engineered totally differently. This one is, is by Noble Jerome, which is Chauncey Jerome's brother, and he develops a, a totally different kind of a movement and therefore avoids any patent lawsuits uh, that would be involved uh, with trying to steal Terry's patent. So. There was competition, and uh, there were uh, many makers entered the field, and uh, the, the clock started being produced in very large volumes. I mean, we're talking tens of thousands of these wooden gear clocks being manufactured. This is a, a display that George Bruno, a local uh, person, he is, uh, has been in the clock business uh, since uh, at least 1971 when I first ran across him. He is considered the master of woodwork repair and he has done major studies on the machinery that built the wooden gear clocks, uh, actually has, has reproduced the machinery to reproduce the parts and he was the guy we would always go to for repairs. He developed this display, and what he wanted to show was what steps were taken to produce a wooden gear clock uh, coming out of the factory. This is considered a Torrington movement because it was it was made in, in Torrington, Connecticut, and it's and it was only made there. This is a unique design, and what he does is is for example he he will start with the plain board, which you see here. And then the first step is you cut out the circle of the gear. The second step is you pull it out, make sure that it's, that it's drilled properly, and then you cut the teeth, and then you put in these uh, uh, lift wires, and this whole piece becomes this piece 
right here. So it took this part to make just this gear. And then you start with a piece of laurel, you put in two pins, you turn it down, you cut the uh, pinion in it, and you cu cut the pinion in the upper part, you put this together with this, and that makes that. Wow. And then that sits right here in the movement. So every aspect of every gear and the labor and the steps that it took to get there was, was put on this particular board and everything comes together to make the entire movement. There was a major exhibition of, of, of horology history done in Switzerland, both with clocks and watches. And one of the things they wanted was this display. So we got special photography to come in and take an image of this and it was blown up to full size and displayed over in Switzerland. I can see, because it says it's beautiful. I mean, just on this one piece alone, we've got one, two, three, four rays, if you will, right. of um, all materials the, all to come together to that make that one piece. And that piece then resides right here. This is brilliant. Yeah, this, is a, this is one of the, the finest uh, exhibits of, of manufacturing processes and clocks that we, that we know of, and we're, we're so thrilled to have it. And he just simplified it. He went through all the, the hard work and everything to put it together, and it can put it so that the average person can understand what they're looking at, starting from the base, working its way right up. That's right. And you can also see uh, that even though we call these wooden work clocks or wooden gear clocks, that there was metal in it. Uh, and the escape wheel is brass, and uh, the, the arbors here are, uh, are steel. Uh, but basically, you got the oak plates again, you got the cherry gears, and you got the, the uh, laurel pinions. Okay, Jennifer, we really want to thank you. We had a wonderful visit here and learned so much and um, just couldn't believe the, the wealth of knowledge that, that you have in, in Tom. We were talking about jewels. Well, he definitely is a jewel of, <laughs> of the American <laughs> Clock and Watch Museum. Yeah, absolutely. For, for sure. And I know that there's other things that you'd like to, to tell us as, as we wrap up our tour. So. Yeah, I, um, well... When, one of the things we, we would love it if uh, people would come and visit and, and we're so thrilled that you got into uh, the history as, as much as you did and stayed as, and visited with us as long as you did. And um, there is a lot to see and that's one of the things that people say when they come is we can't believe how much there is here. Um, so we really ask people to, to plan an hour or, or more to come and visit the museum. And we're opening uh, for the season. We're open generally April through November. Uh, for 2012 season, we're open um, April 14th uh, through December 2nd. And that will be seven days a week from 10 in the morning to 5 in the evening. Um, and aside from that mission, our prices are, are very reasonable. Um, adult admission is $5 and uh, children is $2, I believe. So we're, um, it's a family uh, affordable Absolutely. kind of outing for people. Um, one of the other things is what happens when people come here, what can they expect? Um, we don't always have Tom Grimshaw, <laughs> our curator, I know. We available. We were very, to... <laughs> very fortunate, and we do thank you for that. But if you can rope them into a personal tour, <laughs> <laughs> but when people come here, they have options. Um, we have eight galleries, as you've seen, mm -hmm. um, and people have the option of a self-guided tour. Um, with that, there's also we uh, do periodically. We try to do every week uh, timed guided tours, so that people who want to have that person that come and explain the history and and what they're looking at can have that as well. But we also have the interpretive panels in every gallery. Um, for families, we have a scavenger hunt, so. Um, kids really get into, and parents really get into um, doing the scavenger hunt, which takes you through the galleries. And we also have a cell phone audio tour, which is free with the price of admission. So people are given a map, and at certain sites they can um, call in from their cell phone uh, and learn more about a particular item, which is also a popular thing that we have. Um, one of the other things I mentioned is that we have a lot of programs throughout the year. Uh, I mentioned we're open April. Uh, 14th to December 2nd, but if people are dying to get in here <laughs> in the off season, we're dying to make that possible. So we do um, schedule by appointment. Anyone can come for a visit, group tours, uh, anything. We accommodate anybody uh, as much as possible. Um, we also do programs 
throughout the year, not necessarily just in our open season. And, and some of that includes a, a family workshop series, um, like how to build a family time capsule, uh, activities that families can do together, um, or building a clock, making a clock together. Um, we have periodic clock and watch identification days, which are very popular, where people can bring in an item and we have experts on hand to tell you more about that item to help date it or lead you in the direction for finding more information. We do that on a, a quarterly basis um, so that people regularly have something to look forward to. Um, another item is uh, that we have changing exhibition uh, every year. We're doing a changing exhibition for 2012. Uh, we're focusing on what was happening in the early 1950s with the establishment of the museum, um, looking at what was happening in the community of Bristol and on a national level that affected the clock and watch industry. That exhibit's entitled uh, TV War and Cinderella, um, and we'll have loans from the community and from some area museums, and we're very excited about that one as well. Um, another thing is special events. Every year we have our annual wine tasting, uh, this year we're kicking off our first annual um, cupcake bake-off, um, which we've been affectionately calling the Betty Clocker <laughs> 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 cupcake bake-off. <laughs> so um, just to get new ways to get people in. And one of the ways that we do that too is by renting our facility. Um, we've had weddings here, business meetings. Uh, we invite various groups to use our space. The, the Barnes Wing is set up as a, as a great uh, function space. And we also have um, a colonial garden um, that we haven't been able to see, uh, but the garden is available as well for, for small. Um, well, there was only so much we could do right. here at that point. We can't and, we, show it all. and all we're doing is we're trying to whet the appetite yeah. for the viewing audience so they can see is what we've shown them there's just so much more and they really need to come here and to experience themselves and I'll tell you I think they need more than an hour because yeah. if, if you come with your children or anything there's just so much to see the hands-on you see the displays the history that's there it's uh, to me it, you know I, I think it's a nice afternoon to be able to plan for a family event but I wanted to ask you do you have a website that you would list some of these things for updates. As a matter of fact, we do. Oh, good. <laughs> it's uh, clockandwatchmuseum.org. Um, very easy to find, uh, to Google it to find it. And that has a list of all of our programs. It also has ways in which um, people can get involved. Um, of course, we'd love everyone to give to the annual fun drive and those sorts of things. But we're also we're looking for volunteers um, for various types of activities. Um, and we have an Adopt-A-Clock program as one of the ways that people can help support us. Um, with the Adopt-A-Clock program for $250, uh, a family or an individual can pick out a clock in the museum that's uh, theirs for the year. <laughs> it stays in the museum, but what it's doing is, is giving us the funds to help support the preservation and care of the collection that we have. And uh, so we have businesses that do it as well. Um, and then every year you get a letter from your clock with a photo <laughs> telling you about um, how things went for the year. Um, so that's, it's a fun program that we have and it's growing every year. Um, so get a clock while you still can. We only have a, <laughs> a few thousand. <laughs> well, um, well, Jennifer, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure yes, coming thank you here. So much for coming. And, we, and we thank you for inviting us into your home <laughs> and, and sharing. Um, Tom with us, giving us the opportunity. He spent so many hours with us, and it's just such a joy. I got so excited. I never knew I could get so excited about clocks and the history, and, and I said, rah, rah, America, and I'm just going all the way through, <laughs> and, and, and Tom was just such a joy, and um, I'm sure you're going to have a lot of people coming by to see, because what we just did was the tip of the iceberg, and um, everybody when they come, they will prove us right that this is definitely a jewel within the city. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you.